Israel Update with Gadi Tauk and Mike Duran. Hello and welcome after the Passover vacation to Tablet's Israel Update. I'm Gadi Taub in Tel Aviv and Mike is going to tell you that he's not just in the offices of the Hudson Institute. He is, Mike. In the headquarters. In the headquarters. And there is just no way to prevent your, if you're watching the videos, there's no way to prevent your cat from coming up on your podcast. Because if you lock her in a room, she just shouts. It's 206 days to the war. Uh, Tuesday, April 30th. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know you want to be in the frame. And and things are heating up. And maybe, maybe what we are talking about for the last at least four months is actually happening. The forces arrayed against uh, Netanyahu's government are coalescing, or or so it seems. I saw a tweet, I think it was by Duranimated, if I'm not mistaken, that... Joe Biden is going to get what he wants. Hamas is going to stay on its feet and Netanyahu is going to fall. So, Mike, uh, instead of just the headlines, why don't you describe the situation as you see it reflected in this morning's press? Okay, well, uh, good morning, Gotti. Good to see you back. Uh, Israel has drafted what U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has described as, quote-unquote, an extraordinarily generous proposal for Hamas. That is a proposal for a ceasefire hostage deal um, that it presented to Hamas over the Passover holiday weekend. Uh, the U.S. presented this, or the Israelis presented it uh, to Hamas by way of Egypt. Uh, Qatar was the main interlocutor for some time, but now Egypt has moved front and center. Hamas is said to be studying the pr- proposal and is expected to respond in a few days. Uh, we're hearing different reports about whether it will respond positively or not. Uh, according to many reports, Israel softened uh, its stance on a range of issues, uh, including the number of the hostages to be released in the first stage of the deal. Um, and in addition, Israel also has consented to allow Palestinians, Gazans, to return to the north of the Gaza Strip without going through uh, an Israeli security um, uh, security check or a direct Israeli security check. Israel has um, um, Israel has refused to agree to formally end the war in the context of the proposal that's currently on the table, uh, but that may be the outcome in practice, as you alluded to, Gadi. Let me read you a passage for, from an article this morning by uh, Avi Isakharov. You know, Avi Isakharov is the, the creator of um, Fauda, is he not? He's the writer of Fauda. You know, one of them, yeah. yeah he but he's also, uh, he's also an analyst of, um, of Palestinian politics. Uh, I think his take this morning is very interesting for us to discuss. Okay, I quote him now. Hamas's chief demand until now was a complete ceasefire. The Egyptian proposal does not include this, but it does pave the way to stopping the fighting completely further down the line. The Egyptian proposal says that if the release of 33 hostages proceeds in an orderly manner, more hostages will be released in the future in exchange for extending the ceasefire and, of course, the release of Palestinian prisoners by Israel. It also says that the pause in the fighting will change from being temporary into a permanent one of sorts. So, you see what he's what he, what what he's saying here is that the the Egyptian proposal is calling for a ceasefire in all uh, a, a a an end to the war in all but name. This will and I go back to what Isaharov now. This will allow Netanyahu to claim, mainly to his right wing voters, that he did not agree to stop the war, only to a temporary ceasefire. It bears noting that after long months in which the Qataris led the talks between Hamas and Israel, Egypt and its intelligence officials are now the ones who took the reins on the mediation. Some of those involved in the talks on the Israeli side are senior officials who know the job very well. They were involved in reaching the Shalit deal in 2011, the deal in which Netanyahu, the Netanyahu government released Yahya Sinwar from prison, along with another 1,026 prisoners in exchange for Shalit's release, uh, unquote. I, I think I made a little bit of a mistake there, Gandhi. I said that the 
some of those involved in the talks uh, are senior Israeli officials. I, I think I may I put Israeli in there. I think he he's actually saying that the the Egyptians are the ones who were involved in the Shalit deal. Um, okay, so uh, what has led to the change in the Israeli stance? They've softened on a number of hostages. Israel has reduced its demands uh, from uh, from forty to thirty three, um, and uh, and in in addition, it is now saying that it'll allow people to go back to the north without going through an Israeli checkpoint. The New York Times says it's reporting this morning that the reason that for the change is Israel's assessment that some of the 40 hostages who were who were to be released in a humanitarian deal have died in captivity. The change in the Israeli position, according to the report, uh, raised the expectations among mediators that a deal could actually be reached, in contrast to previous times in which the talks reached an impasse. According to the New York Times, the issue that might derail the talks this time is the duration of the ceasefire. Uh, Hamas wants a permanent ceasefire, and an end to the war, and Israel is only agreed to uh, is only willing to agree to a temporary uh, ceasefire. Within Netanyahu's government, there's he's he's uh, um, he's being pressured uh, by uh, especially those to his right, uh, Betzalel Smutrich and and Ben Gvir. They uh, they threatened actually to bring down the government last week if Netanyahu doesn't uh, 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 doesn't give the order to the military to take uh, Rafah. Uh, ben Kaspit, my favorite columnist, I say that with irony, of course, uh, in Israel, he's saying that another reason why uh, Netanyahu changed his position or the government changed their position in the negotiations, softened it, uh, is because Netanyahu is afraid of the uh, being um, uh, indicted by the International Criminal uh, Court. Uh, uh, a uh, An Israeli analyst that I... Um, truly respect um, Itamar Eichner. He says it's not clear that the uh, threat of an indictment by the International Criminal Court is even real. Uh, of course, Ben Kaspit is saying that Netanyahu is in a, is in a total panic over it, uh, but um, uh, I'm not so sure. I, I'm going to go with Eichner on this, uh, as usual, I think. Mike, uh, if, so I can, if I can intervene before you continue, this is... A... I've, I've, actually, I've actually finished. I think that's that's oh. the picture we have now. Okay, so um, if, on the on the matter of the court and Netanyahu being afraid of it, this is just the latest variation, which is the dominant um, song in the press now that Netanyahu continues the war for personal reasons. That is right. their, so. One is that his coalition will not survive. Another is that he's afraid of the court. If you, uh, I, I, I was. Uh, on some international forum and, and, and some debate and some of a debater there said that, and, the, and I see this in the American press a lot, that Netanyahu is, is uh, continuing the war because the minute he stops it, his criminal cases now in trial in Israeli courts will get to him. Um, and all these stories are completely false. First of all, nothing is stopping the criminal case from continuing against him as the war uh, because of the war, they're not stopping because of the war, uh, and, and these the, these are trains that have already left the station. Secondly, the cases are collapsing in court, and so uh, the press in Israel, which trumpeted them like the American press trumpeted Russian collusion, is now silent about them. And uh, and secondly, uh, th this is an attempt to ignore the fact that Netanyahu represents the majority of Israelis. Uh, let me read you what uh, Tamir Morag, uh, commentator for, a, for Channel 14, uh, has said on his Twitter feed. He said, uh, the, the reckless deal, which means the end of the war, is directly opposed to the... Uh, the heart and the mind of Benjamin Netanyahu, because it will leave him with, without a government, because Ben Gvir and Smotrich are going to to uh, to leave it. It will end his political career, and it will uh, and and it will uh, be the shame of uh, and and it will stick the shame of the Hamas uh, massacre on October seven as the as the ending accord of his career. These are the personal reasons. But Netanyahu in this is backed by the public. And what you saw on social media was A, the, the very noisy voice of the tiny 
fraction of the permanent anti-Netanyahu demonstrations. They're very loud on Twitter. The press almost unanimously support. There was fighting all all over the weekend. You're you're one of the one of the people you follow, Erez Tadmor, a very sharp commentator, was making jokes about the the shabbiness of the press as adopting the idea that there is actually no good reason grounded in interest for Israel to continue the war. So they've they've personalized this issue so much that they are they they are trying to completely blur the fact that there is a real strategic dilemma. But the public is not buying this. And and no, and, and people are supporters of Netanyahu are saying uh, and, and these are not just the radical uh, supporters of Ben Gvir. They're saying if Netanyahu quits this war without victory we, the supporters of Netanyahu, will make sure he is removed from office. So when you describe the pressures that he is under, it's not just personal in a narrow sense. It's personal in the sense that Netanyahu understands that this is a betrayal of Israeli interest to such an extent that he will go down in infamy in history books if he if he opts for that uh, for that shameful deal. Listening to you, you're uh, uh, you're giving uh, pretty much, I think, the identical analysis that I heard from um, Amit Segal in this interview with Christian Amanpour. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. I meant to I meant to tweet it. I forgot. I'm gonna. Uh, I think this is something I think everyone should watch um, because it was the it was that you know Christian Amanpour has the worldview of um, of uh, Thomas Friedman, the New York Times, um, and and uh, Amit Segal has the same worldview that you do. Um, he was speaking very politely uh, and just explaining to her reality. But you could see that the two the two uh, the two worldviews were so incompatible. Uh, it was it was uh, it was just a lovely uh, you know it was a it was a it was a lovely example of two worlds colliding. And so I'll put that on my Twitter feed. I didn't, I, I forgot about it. I saw it. I watched it. But, but Mike, I, explain the clash of the worldviews to, to our viewers and listeners. Well, the, 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 the worldview is that the, that, that uh, is being put out by the, the Biden administration is, is behind this. Um, and, it, and, and, the, and the, um, the news media, uh, the mainstream media in the United States and the anti-Netanyahu media in Israel, which is pretty much all the entire media, uh, they're they're saying that the um, uh, that taking uh, Rafah is not really necessary strategically. That's the 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 Biden administration is saying this explicitly. They're saying we think that you can defeat Hamas through targeted killings and through targeted uh, operations, through special operations and so on. You don't actually have to go in and take this entire city, um, which will cause an enormous amount of uh, uh, an enormous amount of humanitarian suffering. Yeah, collateral, da collateral damage. I have an Israeli friend of mine, someone I love, uh, who, is, uh, um, uh, uh, who is a very left wing, uh, he he was telling me the other day. He's saying that this makes no sense to go into Rafah. It's going to get a lot of Israelis killed. It's going to kill a lot of civilians. It's not really going to weaken Hamas. We don't have to do it. The more the bigger priority is to bring the hostages uh, uh, home right now. That's the that's the worldview. Uh, and so uh, that's Christian Amanpour's view. And she's also saying that. Israel is losing legitimacy. Is losing legitimacy because this war is going on. Have to stop the war. And and isn't Netanyahu doing this purely for personal reasons? And then and and uh, Amit Segal, I I didn't know he knew English so well. He did, he did a very good job of explaining what you just explained. That uh, I, there's he of course he has a personal interest as a politician in uh, you know being successful, but he's successful if he does what. 90% of the Israelis want him to do, which is to win the war by uh, going into Rafah. And, and uh, the idea that Rafah is not a strategic necessity, um, that looks, that seems a little bit silly, uh, uh, silly to me. But um, what what's hard to know is that, uh, you know, I mentioned in the news this morning that, um, you know, Ben Kaspit is saying, that Netanyahu was in a controlled panic. I think that's a, a direct quote. A controlled panic about the International Criminal Court 
uh, uh, indictment. And then Itamar Eichner says eh, it's not clear that this is uh, uh, that this is really happening, um, and it seems to be used by people for political agendas, like Ben Kaspit. But there's a lot that you in in in, in trying to figure out what's going on. There's a lot like uh, of of issues like that. For example, the change in the Israeli position. Uh, did um, how much how much of this is. Uh, is um uh is is Netanyahu bowing to American pressure, making a decision that he's really not going to go into Rafah, and he's really he really wants the deal uh, with the uh, uh, with, with the with, with the um, with Hamas, or he's just giving the Americans as much as he can, and he really wants to go to Rafah. What does he want? In other words, what does Netanyahu really want? Does he really want to go into Rafah or not? Uh, and it, it's not I, I, the answer to me isn't clear there. I, I agree with you that all of these um, people who are a lot of the arguments they're making about his calculations are politically motivated and silly. But given the level of American pressure on him uh, and given the magnitude of the problems he's going to have on the humanitarian front when they go into Rafah, it's not clear to me that that's what he really wants to do tomorrow. I don't I really don't know. Uh, I'm 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 not sure if these are the, the the right terms. What he he wants to do, he knows he needs to finish the job, um, and and so um, it, 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 whatever way or path uh, he he's thinking about for for uh, for winning this war, I don't see any one of them not passing through Rafah. Just remember the the map, Israel more or less emptied the northern part of Gaza uh, from Hamas and most of its inhabitants. It then moved into the, the lower middle with Khan Yunis, but Rafah is adjacent to the border with Egypt. There is an underground highway of smuggling uh, going on through this border. It, the, the hostages can, can, uh, can be smuggled out Weapons are clearly smuggled in, and the Hamas uh, leadership can escape. So clearly, if Israel wants to win this war, this this first round of its big war with Iran, it cannot possibly do it without Rafah. What the press here is saying, uh, to my mind, uh, ridiculously, is that now we need to return the hostages. Then we will attack Rafah. Oh, oh, okay. Have time. Okay. There's time for okay. that. Okay, I agree that 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 they the press is pushing that line for political reasons. Here, but here's what I uh, here's what I, uh, is starting to impress me. The last major maneuver on the ground by the IDF in Gaza was in December against Khan Yunus. So we're 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 now how many how, we're now moving into the month of May. So five months have gone by. Where we where we have been here on this podcast saying, next stop Rafah, next stop Rafah. You know, I, I sent you. Uh, why don't you put up that? Um, I sent you a cartoon. cartoon. Yeah, yeah, from uh, yeah, Guy Morad from Yediot, right? This, yeah. this is this is the picture that I have in my head of what's what's going on. So Netanyahu is sitting in this car, and the the ramshackle license plate says. Total victory. So he's on the he's in the car to total victory, and the 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 uh, road sign on the other side of the intersection says Rafah. So Rafah straight ahead, and that's the way to total victory. But there's Biden with the red light. Uh, uh, Biden saying don't. Uh, and Ben Gvir turns to Netanyahu and says, "What are you waiting for? Uh, you ha uh, haven't you ever run a red light before?" So but that's pretty much what it's that 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 to me captures the essence of what's going yeah, on right now. For Israelis, United there's another there's another layer that we that we need to explain is that uh, over the weekend or the day before the weekend, uh, Ben Gvir's driver passed a red light and, ah, and, and uh -huh, involved yeah, yeah. in an accident in which he was wounded, and and people use that to say that Ben Gvir is uh, reckless, lawless, and uh, should not be. Should not be in government. So uh, the idea hey, in this cartoon just, is that I just ben remembered. Ben I just ben remembered. Smotrich are pushing Netanyahu to do something that he doesn't want. I just remembered one. Uh, uh, am I going uh, too far afield here? When I uh, 
when I when I remember uh, Shalom Chanoch, who lo be'adom. Remember that? Uh, no, no, you're not too far afield. So tell us. It was a song from the I don't know when was that 80s 90s about Sharon. It was the 80s because it was the Lebanon War. Yeah, and the uh, Shalom Chanoch had this song uh, about Sharon. Uh, that, that was stop, be, that was he before Sharon stop. turned leftward and became a, a it became a, a hero of the left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Sharon, he doesn't he doesn't stop at red lights is the name of the song. What's yeah, that so, bad song by the way? So so let me complicate the picture uh, okay. because the pressures you described are the I'd say the major avenues of of pressure but the the biden administration is using multiple other channels so maybe the indictments in the international court are not going to move forward but the threat is in the air the court can also conceal indictments they it can also put them on hold with a condition saying if you enter rafah then there will be this and that uh, clearly, the Americans have great influence there. The uh, prosecutor was chosen by America and does the uh, Biden administration's bidding or so we believe. Then there are the IDF officers, and there's more than just rumors that the IDF is dragging its feet because it's very intimate with the American army and the American army is aligned with its government while the Israeli army is not. So these upper echelons of the army, what the Israeli pundits call the Wexner army, those who were educated in American university courtesy of the Wexner Foundation program and are considered progressive and pro-American. And so they think of their role as stopping the wildness of Ben Gvir Smutrich and Netanyahu. So there's the army there. We had two episodes here that were, were, were demonstrative of that. One is that Netanyahu promoted Roman Goffman, who is oh, yeah. a very a aggressive uh, general of the kind we need. And there's a video of him, and we, you and I discussed it, I think I, sa I sent you a copy recently, where he says, before this is Gadi Eisenkot's end of command, and 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 so this is a while back, and he says to the uh, to the top brass of the IDF, he's the commander of a, a an armored division. He said, "You're not using us. We can do a lot of things, and we're sitting idle, and we're we're ready for command for a command. Just give it." And 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 there's a shot of them uh, laughing at him which in light of October 7, these are this Khaliva there, Aaron Khaliva is the failed now resigned uh, chief of uh, IDF intelligence. And there is Herzia Levy and all this, the whole band of generals who's sitting them sneering at this uh, old timer who thinks we need armor. We have cyber and we have we have high F-35s and we have technology and we don't, we, we are, this is child's play. So Roman Goffman was appointed to be Netanyahu's army liaison. And the and he press, was also, we're, sorry, go ahead. And the press went wild and found, uh, and, and found uh, things that he said that they presume are very radical and very right wing and so not appropriate, yes, but I, I, I have one one more uh, Can I just say, issue let to me mention, just, but yeah, intervene. Let me just say something about uh, Roman Goffman, two, two, two things. Yeah. Um, what, one is that he, he was a personally uh, courageous and, and heroic on October 7th. He was. Uh, I don't know the full story, but basically he grabbed his weapon and he went to go fight uh, and was wounded. Uh, I don't know the full circumstances of how he was wounded and so on. Uh, but uh, but that uh, adds another wrinkle to the story or an aspect that's interesting. And the second thing is you you said that they found things that about him that um, that were that were used were debt that they're using to uh, to smear his reputation. He he circulated I think as Netanyahu's um, uh, uh, military advisor, but I may be wrong. At any rate, he wrote a paper. Uh, uh, which they're saying is his, which he, in defense of him, they're saying is his personal opinion, in which he said that uh, in, at the end of the war, Israel has to control, uh, has to be in control of the uh, of the civilian infrastructure in Gaza. So it has to rule over uh, the Gazans in order to de Hamasify the, the population. This, this to me, by the way, is kind of common sense. 
uh, but uh, but uh, there are many, many forces uh, in the world and in Israel who are against a military occupation of, of Gaza. Course. And, and, and in the American administration, of course. And in the American administration, right. I mean, they, this cause, but that's one of the things that why this paper leaked, because they want to cause friction between Netanyahu and the Americans, I presume. Exactly. And just to give you the, 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 the progressive mood of the elites, which I think is represented clearly by Anthony Blinken and... Joe Biden and their whole administration and among Israelis is, I'll quote, someone who's not a general. Although she was married to someone who got a, the highest medal in Israel for, the, for his bravery in the Yom Kippur War, Professor Yuli Tamir, she's a student of Isaiah Berlin. She wrote a doctorate uh, in, in history in Oxford, England, and she is now the president of an arts college. And, and there was a slogan in Israel, Be'yachad Nenatzeach, together we will win. And she said that she replaced this slogan in her college because there are Arab students. She replaced together we shall win with together we shall overcome. And we, so, we talked about this. We, we did. You, we you, did yeah, you, screen, you screened that here, I believe. I, I, I think so. I mean, you showed it to me at one point. I can't remember. I think it was on the show. I, I did. So, yeah. so this is my, you know, it's my favorite trope for understanding them. But the problem is that the army is like that, too. The army is like, you know, Khalifa was quoted saying that our next mission is to worry about the environment or something like that. So you so you see where they're coming from. Next appointment is a non-appointment. There I got I have to every time you say that, I always I, ha I always have to say I, I, I don't I don't uh, I think you go too far on that. I, I go too far. Yeah, I do. Well, that, that's good because oh. I don't go far enough. So, we, <laughs> so between your I opinion think, and I what think... I should do, I'm I'm <laughs> smack dab in the middle. Right, right, right in the right in the the sensible you, middle. This okay. is a compromise. You always, I, I, I always, okay. But, but I, let I, me I, finish about the appointments yeah, because go ahead. the other story is no less demonstrative and no less important. It's the story of Dvir Hever, who jumped to replace the commander of a unit called Refaim. It's not exactly, but it's something like ghosts. And they are they are considered an, not just an elite unit, but the unit that was most successful in killing uh, Hamas uh, or, um, uh, um, combatants. And, and, and he, he himself, he's I think the only, uh, the only one at his rank, which is Aluf Mishneh, what is it, Colonel? The I only, so. there, there are only two uh, commanders of his rank that actually led the forces into battle. He's one of them. He's considered one of the IDF's bravest people. And when he finished his tour of duty, he asked to get permanent command of his unit and was refused by the IDF. And so he quit the army. And 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 we, I don't know what, what will go on with him until then, but all over the, uh, the right-wing feed, there were jokes about... Uh, Oh, I went to check out who this Dvir Hever is, and lo and behold, I wasn't surprised. And you see, he wears a knitted yarmulke. He's a religious Zionist, and his woman, his wife, is with a head head covering. And so, the, the, what happened to the army, in the eyes of many, myself included, is that systematically, people who are who have a, a philosophy of victory or who belong to the right and or are religious or affiliate with the settlers or three of these cannot get promoted in the army. Instead, we promote the Khalivas and the Ganses. And so uh, if you if you have something to say about Dvir, um, you do it now and then we can move to the next. Uh, no, 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 nothing to say, but uh, but are, are you are going to uh, you are going to discuss the tweet by Gantz, are you not? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that was the, the next stage is to say. Yeah, because yeah, this is a logical place. Yes, because uh, this we can't we can't uh, we can't not we can't just ignore this. it. It's so quite, it's quite amazing, actually. It, it's amazing. And we'll show it. And you and you have posted a translation of it. So I'll put the whole thing on the screen in a minute. But what I wanted to say is that apart from having the IDF probably dragging its feet and, and putting obstacles in Netanyahu's road to Rafa and except the, the other pressures from the coalition, there is also pressure from Gantz and Eisenkot, the faction within the, the, uh, 
the little kitchen in the cabinet, what is called the, the, the war cabinet, which is very small, uh, in which they have a, a veto. So, so Gallant is a mm, moderate. Gantz is considered an American, an American representative. Uh, some have argued that he's been called back and forth to America in order to get instructions from the White House on how he is to conduct himself. And it certainly seems so if you look at this tweet. So, uh, Mike, why don't you uh, read the English? Okay, so uh, entering Rafah is important in the long struggle uh, against Hamas. The return of our abd abductees abandoned by the October 7 government uh, is urgent and of far greater importance. So he's saying, okay, yes, Rafak is important, but the, the getting the hostages is more important. If a responsible uh, outline is reached for the return of the abductees, so, uh, of the hostages, with the backing of the entire security system, which is, does not involve the end of the war, and the ministers who led the government on October 7th prevent it, then the government will not have the right to continue to exist and lead the and 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 lead the campaign. So yes. he's he's putting like the Biden administration, he's putting pressure on the government to accept the hostage uh, the hostage deal that is on offer that that might be on offer by Hamas. We keep waiting for Hamas to say yes. Uh, by the way, an interesting little development here, uh, but which I just want to throw out here is that. Ira Iranian aligned press across the um uh, across the region in Lebanon and elsewhere is advising Hamas not to take the 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 deal because they say it'll work into the, to the it'll work the advantage of the Biden administration and its efforts to bring Israel and and Saudi Arabia closer together uh, just a little <laughs> interesting wrinkle there so it you know last time the, the reason I mentioned it is because on April 4 uh, Biden called up Netanyahu and and really came down on him like a ton of bricks and said, send an empowered team to uh, to Cairo to cut the deal with Hamas. He had clearly gotten signals from the Qataris and others, I think, that Hamas Hamas had given him signals that Hamas is ready to cut the deal. And then when the Israelis came, made some concessions, were ready to to, to go, and, and Netanyahu and uh, Biden was putting enormous pressure on them, Hamas changed its terms. Uh, and basically said, get lost. We want a complete end of the war and we want more hostages. Uh, we want more uh, prisoners re released than you're willing yeah. to release. Mike, can I ask you what you think about the deal? You, would you would you have, with, suppose you could get it without the end of the war. Do you think uh, there's any point in, in accepting it? Uh, I think at this point they have to, but I think they've gone this, they, they basically have said, they basically given their terms uh, to the uh, the Israelis have given their terms to the Egyptians. The Egyptians have put them to Hamas. If Hamas says yes, I think it's a done deal. And uh, and yeah. clearly, uh, clearly Netanyahu has been working with the Gantz and others to come up with this uh, uh, with this proposal. So so yeah. I, I so I, the, there's no um, I'm I look I'm I'm of the I personally believe the number one thing is to destroy Hamas. To, uh, they 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 need to go into Rafah. They need to control the passages from Egypt. That's the strategically important thing. And I don't agree with 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 Gantz. It's not. I don't believe that 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 the that the um, host, releasing of the hostages is more important than that. Uh, obviously, releasing the hostages is important. But they are where they are. They have agreed to this. Uh, and so my views about it don't really uh, enter into it here. Yeah, m mine are not going to influence reality either. But I think even even the terms that Israel is supposedly has agreed to, which I'm not sure is exactly true, are terrible. And it should backtrack from them. And Netanyahu, if he accepts that deal, is finished. And well, there's a cost. There's a cost of backtracking as well, though. At this point, I mean, but, but yeah, yeah here, but but here's the but, but but let me be clear about this. Netanyahu, if he accepts this deal, is finished, and this government is finished. And I think instantly, the majority of Israelis are not depressed. As Amit Segal rightly says, ninety percent of Israelis think that leaving Hamas on its feet is a complete betrayal of the deepest interest of the state and the idea that the, the, the fate, the terrible fate 
of a number of living hostages, probably the, what, what is the, the number circulating is 33 hostages, can it justifies putting the uh, 9 million citizens of Israel in, 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 in existential danger, let alone the fact that, that some people like me believe that Netanyahu's original sin was accepting the Shalit deal, in which a thousand terrorists, or a little more, were released for one soldier. What we taught Hamas is that we would do anything to uh, uh, release our hostages, and therefore it concentrated its effort on taking hostages because it understood it could bring us to our feet. This is an escalating process. Next thing you will see, if this terrible deal is struck, even without finishing the war, even with conditions that, that, that were on the table three weeks ago and some people thought were reasonable, accepting this deal means that Hamas, Iran, Others will next try to take a thousand hostages. I don't know where, in a cruise ship, in a in a school, in a, a, in a isolating part of the country, in invading another festival, or I don't know what we are. Th this is and 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 the fact that we have given in to this emotional extortion at the expense of rational uh, calculation of our interest is is terrible. So when you count the pressures on Netanyahu, there is the, he is also with his back to the wall with his supporters who have made it clear to him that they will not just abandon him, but turn against him instantly. Remember, there are about 150,000, according to the recent estimates, of displaced persons who left their homes in the north and in the Western Negev. The only way Netanyahu can reach some compromise in Rafah and survive is if he immediately attacks Hezbollah, because the Israeli public yeah. understands that this is that the, the Gaza uh, arena is just the smallest arena in the large war against Iran. Before you, you respond, just let me also point out the wording that Benny Gantz is using. Audaciously, Benny Gantz is saying the abductees abandoned by the, the October yeah, 7th yeah, government. Yeah. This is a slogan of the anti Bibi demonstrations, the abandoned, Hufkarnu. This is their sticker. And this is an attempt in which they, the whole hostage, the, the, the demonstrations to release the hostages are, are the, the, the most morally abhorrent thing we've seen in Israel in a long time, because what they are doing is raising the price of. Uh, Yihya Sinwar's price for the hostages because they're putting pressure on our government. So Sinwar is sitting in that tunnel and say, oh, let the Biden administration and the anti-Bibi crowd pressure him more so I can raise the price. We might have had the hostages back if we continued maximum pressure because the deal we had last time was achieved when Hamas was with its back to the wall. Now we don't have it. And having Gantz say this is, is mind-boggling because because the idea, the, why is this Hufkarnu, this we, we were abandoned slogan, tries to pin all the responsibility on Netanyahu and maybe his government and absolve everyone else. While the real problem, which Netanyahu is, is part of, of course, is the conception that has been wrong for many, many years. And Benny Gantz was uh, uh, deputy chief of the IDF, he was chief of the IDF, he was minister of defense, and he bears, um, a, a, and, and, he, and he appointed many of these failures in the, among the IDF brass. So now Benny Gantz adopting this rhetoric against Netanyahu and pretending to be responsible, this looks like it was cooked up by strategic advisors. Oh, and, it was, it and, was. You, you, could, you could, that was a tweet that was... Uh... That was a tweet that was written by committee. You can be sure, and, and including people who were looking at polling and other things, including Americans. Including oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There are Americans in there too. I'm sure. I'd love. I'd like to. I'd like to be a fly on the wall of that committee to see who's involved there. The one thing, Benny Gantz, let's see if Benny Gantz one... will suffer any repercussions for this. Because as I said many times before, when Benny Gantz cooperates with American pressure, this undermines him with the constituency he hopes will 
will uh, elect him. And mind you, Benny Gantz leaving the government will not topple the coalition. The coalition has a majority without Benny Gantz and his party. So he, he, can, he can go the Yair Lapid way and desert the government and then find himself politically stranded. I, I, I want to make two points here. One is about the tweet itself. And then, and then one little thought about response to everything you just said. Um, the tweet uh, goes some distance in um, supporting your earlier analysis um, because he says in there, he speaks in the name of the security establishment against Netanyahu. And he says, if the, you know, if the, if the, if Netanyahu doesn't go forward with a deal that has the support of the security establishment, then uh, then then it, he doesn't have the right to lead or what I, whatever his words were. But it, that's but that's it's interesting. That's the first time maybe he's done it before, but it's the first time I saw him, um, uh, you know, r representing the security establishment as a whole against Netanyahu. And I think he's got uh, the the press at least says that it. That he's working uh, closely with uh, Gallant in the um, uh, in this effort. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what the the press is presenting Gantz and Gallant as a as as a unit, um, which m does raise the question: If Gallant was to resign, that would be a crisis for the government. Uh, um, okay, um, I just wanted to say in response to what you're saying. I my my contribution to this whole discussion, my major contribution is to um, is to talk about the American uh, the Biden administration's policies, what they really are, um, as opposed to what a lot of people believe them to be, uh, but also to talk about what I think the American interest is here, um, and th that uh, coming from that perspective, it changes my view of uh, the pressures on Netanyahu a little bit. And I've, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but it's worth saying it in this context. The everything you say about uh, about the pressure that Netanyahu is under from public opinion and the strategic importance of taking Rafah, all that's true. But you also have to keep manage the United States and keep the United States on your side. If you look at all the. Look at all the ways the Biden administration is, si is signaling to the Israeli government that they're in trouble. They, they, they've, they're, they're sanctioning uh, Netzach Yehuda. This uh, the Netzach Yehuda. Yeah, Netzach Yehuda. It's, yeah, Yehuda. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and they are so they're, they're, they're sanctioning, sanctioning a unit within the army. This is also the, not just a breach of protocol. This is an undermining of Israel's sovereignty because this is a unit of the IDF. This is not some militia. So they're yeah. reaching into the IDF and sanctioning. They've they've abandoned that plan, but so they said they but, would. Oh, okay, yeah, but they're but okay. So they're not sanctioning, but they're threatening to sanction. Okay, mm -hmm. they're threatening to withhold arms. They are uh, uh, they are threatening to uh, withhold support for Israel in the in the in the UN, and they have already withheld it. it yeah, they've done it. Yeah, but they're threatening that that's a that's the, there were no consequences there, but they're there if they in another context, there could be very serious uh, uh, consequences. They are uh, they are um, threatening indirectly the the Israelis through the ICC. Like you say, the, the, no, no one sees the Biden administration's fingerprints directly on that. But I, we all believe that 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 the uh, the ICC wouldn't be moving in this direction or threatening to move in this direction if the Biden administration hadn't created a frame in which it was possible for them to uh, to do that. They are threatening to recognize a Palestinian state um, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. These are these are all really serious pressures on uh, um, on, on on the government um, and they have to they can't just they, like that caricature showed they can't just run the red light and uh you know and and ignore what biden is uh what biden is saying as much as i don't like what biden is saying i don't think that biden is representing the american interest uh i think he or the views of americans as we saw or the views of americans i don't think he is but and, and here is the key mike but, and this is where i i understand your 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 uh cautious uh uh, stance, but I've been thinking for a long time that we are running out of things to lose by a more direct confrontation. This administration is attacking Netanyahu directly and publicly and asking to remove him. 
uh, this say can strengthen Netanyahu with, with with the Israeli public, but also I think that we have other instruments with which to signal to the United States that we can be a highly disruptive force, and that a head-on collision is, you you know, um, I, I don't mean to to say that we can we can arm wrestle the United States into submission, but for instance, we could start saying more publicly to the American people that the pro-Iranian policy, which is called regional integration in its laundered uh, uh, euphemism, is a pro-Iranian uh, anti-Israeli uh, um, uh, policy, which would not be popular with the American public, and Biden must be mindful of that in a year when he seems to be in increasing trouble. He's not taking a stand against uh, campus anti-Semitism. And now adding to that the abandonment of Israel, it can be a serious liability to him. And I think we should stop playing only defense. Uh, as you keep saying about the military, we uh, in diplomacy too, we have to be, to begin to be more bold. And I think we will arrive there, but I don't want us to start playing this these cards when it's too late and too desperate because we're heading there and the, the United States is putting us in existential danger. If one people are, I'll, I'll tell you what the mood is here. People are saying, that Israel may not survive another four years of Biden. Israel may not survive. And, and just remember, this is less than a century after the Holocaust. And if Israel would be faced with another Holocaust, it can become very desperate. And it's not without means to cause trouble. I still hear uh, from uh, uh, American Jews, there are still people who are saying, and, and I'm not talking about silly people, that Biden is the most pro-Israel president ever. So, so we have a, so we have a lot to do in explaining, right? But the, this is a, no, but but the um, uh, so the the ability of you know you know there's this there was this amazing moment in the in the 1970s, late 70s, when the Americans under Jimmy Carter were going to go recognize the PLO. And they wanted to have an international conference that would bring the Soviets and the Syrians. Uh, they they were the, the Carter was moving against the Kissinger view of how to do diplomacy, which is to push bilateral negotiations so, and, and especially the bilateral Egyptian Israeli track. That was the one that was getting the most attention from Kissinger, and he saw as the strategically important, most important track. Um, and the Carter administration came in with this idea of comprehensive peace which included recognizing the PLO because just like just like um, now and these days, uh, Bi Biden is resurrecting the two-state solution and putting the Palestinians front and center. That's what Carter was doing in the late 70s. And uh, Moshe Dayan was the uh, Begin's uh, foreign minister. And he came to New York and he, he met with, uh, with, with Carter and he told Carter, if you continue down, this, like directly told him, if you continue down this route and you recognize the PLO, I will I, I will mobilize American Jewry against you. Right. And that was a serious threat. And Carter didn't go, didn't uh, Carter backed off from his intention to recognize the um, the PLO, uh, probably as a result of that um, uh, of that uh, threat from from Diane. Now, if Netanyahu were to sit with, were to tell Biden, I'm going to mobilize American Jewry against you, Biden would laugh at him because he'd say, I, you, you, I have Tom Friedman on my side, you know, Tom Friedman and, uh, and everyone who thinks like Tom Friedman, which is a significant number of people. Yeah. Yeah. I think we are, I think we're in trouble in that respect. And I'm, and I'm not sure enough American Jews are waking up to that reality. But what I mean is that Netanyahu don't, that shouldn't, uh, threaten or hint that he will mobilize, mobilize American Jews, but the American public in general, and especially 
evangelical opinion, but generally we saw in the polls, Americans are far more pro-Israel than they are pro-Hamas. They are far more pro-Israel than they are pro-Iran. And the Biden administration has been cheating the American public about its policy in the Middle East. And we should start exposing these lies. I mean, not just we should, because you have, obviously, and we do often, but Israel as a country should. And I think Netanyahu is not uh, not being bold enough on that front. I think he should also tell the Israeli public if his own ministers are working against him, and he should tell the Israeli public if his own generals are disobeying the uh, the government of of Israel. But Mike, we are we have run out of time, and we do yeah. have dumbest takes on the news. And your dumbest take is your favorite American journalist, more than Ben Caspit, even. Yeah, my dumb mistake is just Tom Friedman's column last uh, in the New York Times last Friday. Got a lot of attention. He said uh, the, the choice between Netanyahu is, is Rafah or Riyadh. He can, it, 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 it's everything that we've been talking about. We don't have to spend any time on it, but he can go to, the, the choice that Friedman says Netanyahu uh, faces is go forward to Rafah and lose all the legitimacy of the world uh, and do this, you know, just to go to look after your own narrow political interest, or take the high road uh, that's better for Israel and go normalize relations with Saudi Arabia with the help of the Biden administration and help create a new a new Middle East and an uh, anti-Iran coalition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's complete. This is such a nonsensical view of the world of yeah, what the choice of what the actual choice is. Before Netanyahu, we talked about it here. Does he know? Does he know? Does Thomas Friedman know he's selling a lie? No, he doesn't know. No, no, no he's sincere. He's that he's, he's like, a, he... look, I, I, uh, I used to like the guy a lot. I used to read him. He because when I was an academic, I thought he added a little bit of, you know, people in academia yeah. read him, and I thought he added a little bit of reality. But he, there's always been this delusional thing. He, you remember? I don't know if you remember the Saudi, uh, you know, the Arab peace plan. The the, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the the Saudi peace plan. So um, the uh, he it, he was the one who broke the story of the Saudi peace plan, and the the uh, he and he told the story in his in his column. He goes, you know, he goes to um, uh, he, he goes to Riyadh and Crown Prince of Dal, I think it was. Says, you know, he's talking. He's he's in, he, he's having an he's having an interview with Crown Prince of Dal, and 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 it's and, not and an Abdullah, interview. It's a heart to heart. A heart to heart. Yeah, you see, he's looking. He wants to talk to Tom Friedman. Wants some advice, life advice. You know, and he's and, it, and they're talking about peace with Israel, and 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 Abdullah, oh, you know, Friedman, because so he can later brag that he knows him. Yeah. He, he <laughs> so Abdullah can brag that he knows yeah, Friedman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he. Uh, uh, Abdullah does uh, opens a drawer, a drawer in his desk and says, "You know, I've got a peace plan here, but I really don't know if I should let it out." Because <laughs> what do you do with a with a with a New York Times reporter? You tell them your secrets, you know, the things you're not sure. Because <laughs> uh, they they, cause they keep them. Friedman, Friedman, Friedman. I think he truly believes that he convinced Abdullah to to release this. Yeah, but, but he so, has a yeah. talent. He, he has a rhetorical talent to create false symmetries and elegant um, puzzles in which everything fits together. And you yeah. know, it's like a, some some political philosophers have have that talent to to cover contradictions with 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 flowing phrases. In his case, it's a half macho, uh, nitty gritty, um, uh, hard boiled realism with which he yeah. covers complete fantasy. And so we, let's stay. And, and, and of course, he's a he's a mouthpiece. He's being manipulated by the he's being it, 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 one of his columns. I, I think I pointed this out here when I took when I when I presented yeah, he took my, dictations so from Blinken. He, took, he, he, he basically said, I'm taking dictation from from uh, from Blinken. Yeah. So, and, and, and the, and they're fooling him. But, but so, well, let's stay on. on Can on I just one more thing, though? It's it's heady stuff. It's heady stuff. I saw an, a, a podcast or an interview with Friedman, and he said, you know, that his task, our task right now, is to bring down Netanyahu. Netanyahu is the is the most dangerous thing that the, the, the dangerous uh, the, the biggest danger to the Jewish people to the Israelis today is Netanyahu and I Tom Friedman am going to bring him down 
that if you if you're like even you know 60 percent sincere when you say that it's heady stuff you're at the forefront of the movement to save israel by getting rid of this horrible horrible bad man benjamin netanyahu yeah and, and uh, against the will of israel's uh, people and, the, the Arab i guarantee people. i guarantee if we had his if we could read his email we'd see lots of very very significant people including world leaders including uh, billionaires you know, including uh, beautiful Hollywood actresses, are 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 sending him emails saying, "Thanks, oh, Tom. Thanks. You're fighting the good fight for me." You know, if I if Hollywood beautiful Hollywood actresses would send me messages like that, I'd change my views. Um, and let's just sum up this conversation about Tom Friedman with saying that he believes that the Earth is flat, and I think that uh, says uh, everything. Um, so um, now to from. In Hebrew, we say from subject to subject on the same subject. Journalists who are mouthpieces. Is there anything more ridiculous than Barak Ravid accepting a prize from the people he is supposed to cover? And so he accepted with a tuxedo, a prize and a hug from Joe Biden, which he covers for Axios. And this is this is an Israeli journalist. And he reached this pinnacle of his career by slandering the IDF, among other things, in the effort to portray us as a rogue, undisciplined power. And this is in, a, in a, an interview that was, was widely circulated in Israel with Hebrew subtitles at the Anderson Cooper show on CNN, where he said the army, the IDF was once professional, but it's now wild. Let's who take did the Hebrew? Who did the Hebrew subtitles? Uh, I did one version. I think Erel Segal did another version. I did for my show on Friday nights. And and whenever I tweet this, it just goes wild because people are, you know, we people are dying in Gaza. These are our relatives. And here sits this arrogant, I don't I, I don't want to use any any ruder, ruder words. Just call, him a, just, 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 call him, just, just call him a journalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have a hashtag. In in on Hebrew Twitter, be Israel any tonut. There is no journalism in Israel, and 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 that's largely true. There's a political chorus, and journalism has changed its own perception of its mission. You described it very well with Tom Friedman. It no longer trucks in information. It doesn't seek to inform its political activism. It has political missions in the service of which it distorts reality. And listen to what Barak Ravid had to say on Anderson Cooper about the brave men and women and commanders who are fighting in Gaza now. You know, you remember that just a few weeks ago, three Israeli hostages that managed to escape their captors were killed by Israeli soldiers who, who fired at them even though they were uh, holding a, a white flag, okay? And, you know, I spoke to um, uh, an Israeli reserve officer who was in the same unit of those soldiers who shot those hostages. And I remember him telling me that the orders are basically from the commanders on the ground is just shoot every man in fighting age. Mm. Those are the orders. <laughs>
on Tuesday. Stay put until then. Thank you.